Welcome to the Home Health Minute, your monthly podcast brought to you by the Home Health Section of the American Physical Therapy Association, hosted by Troy Mead. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Home Health Minute podcast, the official podcast of the Home Health Section. Uh, today, we've got a special episode with Dee Cornetti, the section president, and she's going to be interviewing Eva Norman. So without any further ado, I'll let Dee take the reins. Hey, thanks, Troy. And um, I'm really glad that we have this opportunity today um, because some interesting things have been happening in light of the COVID-19. And I know all you uh, section members have been able to resource through APTA um, and their COVID resource page, as well as the home health section and all the links in between the different sections and, co- and, and academies on collaboration. But I've been hearing a lot and received a fair amount of e- emails and um, and Eva and I's path has crossed. So I, I want to bring Eva in on this specific issue and just let you, uh, first of all, meet her if you haven't already met her. Um, so Eva, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you are and what you do and, you know, uh, and then we can get right into it today. Absolutely. Thanks, Dee. And I appreciate also the section. This is quite an honor to be on a podcast, to be honest. I'm constantly listening. You guys do such a great job. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And hopefully what I share today can help many of you. So I am actually a physical therapist and I'm the owner of a company called Live Your Life Physical Therapy. And I'm also as well the founder and we primarily specialized in health, wellness and prevention. Uh, We have eight different services that we offer, PT, OT, speech therapy, personal training, acupuncture, massage, health coaching and dietary services. There's uh, 25 of us um, pretty much all over the nine county Twin Cities Metro here in Minnesota and providing those type of services either in the home or in the community. So uh, hopefully that's a good introduction, Dee, to what we do. Yeah, that's great, um, Eva. And, um, you know, for any of you that have attended section events at combined sections, um, like our business meeting, you always see Eva coming around in a red jacket um, collecting for the uh, PT pack. So she does it with such a smile on her face. Anyway, um, Eva, you and I's path have crossed over a couple different things these last few weeks related to treatment of patients during a period of social isolation and social distancing in these congregate living facilities. And we're hearing a lot about um, individuals, whether they be private practitioners, um, Part B providers, um, or, or outpatient clinics that sometimes staff home health agencies, really being able to access mm-hmm. our patients living in independent and, and uh uh, assisted living type settings. And I know you see some patients there through living your life, um, your, your business, um, but, but you've had some real challenges that have come up um, recently with, with accessing these patients who do have physician orders, whether they be for um, uh, private services, um, outpatient orders, or even home health uh, orders through an agency. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've encountered and, and some things that you've done to problem solve around getting access to these patients while we have very strict measures to social distance and restrict people going in and out of these facilities? Absolutely, Dee. Thanks for the question. So just a little background, as I mentioned, you know, we primarily do health, wellness, and prevention. And on March 16th, essentially, our governor closed all bars, restaurants, and pretty much places of public accommodations. Um, With that went about 75% of our caseload. And so we quickly had to come up with creative and innovative ways to kind of keep our staff busy, because I certainly didn't want to lay anyone off, but I was forced to do some, but certainly didn't want all of our staff to go. So we actually ended up contracting with a premier home care agency here in the area, um, and we're set up to do provide Medicare Part A services. And the majority of the, of the business that we get from them are um, providing services in congregate living, so assisted and independent living facilities as well as group homes and those residential homes that they've now converted into some like group living. And so that's like, I would say 90% of our business. Otherwise, we do go to residential homes as well or just regular um, yeah, residential homes, but that's the majority of our business. So, so of course, that forced me into um, problem solving quickly. I mean, it was literally overnight here. Like we were so excited to get all of these cases. And then what we're, run- what we're running into rather quickly because um, after the closure came up on March 21st, uh, Minnesota had its first fatality. And that's when facilities got really scared. It um, literally, we were starting to get emails. No, we were not allowing anyone in the facility. And at first we thought, okay, they're probably talking about visitors. 
And then um, the governor actually spoke and um, shortly after that mentioning that he would have a stay home order in place um, starting on March 27th at midnight that night through April 10th. And then all of a sudden doors closed to everything. I mean, it was difficult to get into any place for that matter. Uh, so, you know, of course, here we go from being all excited to, to you know, obviously, um, you know, having lost all the, you know, all these clients because to be honest, through COVID, um, wellness has been very difficult in the sense that a lot of people are scared, you know, whether they're going to have enough money to get through this crisis. And so um, people have been very conservative with their money and not wanting to spend as much. So we're not seeing our wellness clients necessarily that often, which is obviously understandable. Um, and so, you know, going into this population, you know, reached out, of course, to the section, which I, I thank you so much for all the resources that you've provided. And so I kind of gathered kind of what I could find through the section, contacting some friends, and then, of course, the, the resources that I could find um, in Minnesota. And one of the things that really was helpful that I thought I would share, because I know I've been talking to many therapists across the country I thought I would share just some resources that I've utilized and also some context of me that hoping to help that hopes that it helps you. So the, the, we started with the governor's executive order um, in there and most of them, and I've read several of your states out there that are listening, um, your executive orders, and it, it's pretty much similarly laid out in the sense that we are listed in many of these as essential and critical sectors. And they'll frequently um, reference the CISA, uh, which is, of course, a, a government uh, critical infrastructure workforce. And in there, we're actually listed as a profession, as physical therapy, as well as also um, the setting is listed there, home care. And so that document helped considerably in educating individuals as far as the fact that we were considered essential. Because a lot of the facility would say, well, you're not essential. And, you know, and so we're, we're not letting you in the facility. So with that document, along with um, the section put together a beautiful document, I'm sure you've had it before, but I've, I have not seen it previously, kind of showing the value of our services. So between those two documents is kind of how we started the conversation. Um, next, um, you know, I contacted the Minnesota Home Care Association because I thought I felt like I needed far more resources. Um, there was, you know, I just felt like there was still facilities that just didn't quite understand even reading the executive order and, and of course the government website, they still were just like, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we're, we're being told um, that you're, you're not the case. And so, but I kind of dug in deeper and I wanted to know where that was coming from. And pre frequently people were referencing our, the Minnesota Department of Health. And of course, across the country, we all have departments of health. So I contacted the Minnesota Home Care Association, seeing if they had a contact there that I could connect with. And they gave me the name of uh, the, the provider line. There's supposedly a healthcare provider line and also the number to the COVID crisis line that they have started. So of course, connected with those two different departments and got very far. I mean, I had some great conversations with individuals there. They were very concerned to know that they weren't allowing us um, knowing um, and understanding the executive order. So um, thankfully, and, and they had also expressed that there were other providers because not only were facilities restricting therapists, but they're restricting nursing as well as physicians. So with um, because of that, they actually put together another document. And I will be sharing this with the podcast, all these different documents so that you can see obviously was very helpful. And so that document was huge for us because it came from that very organization that many people were referencing that, you know, that's why, um, you know, that's why they were not allowing us. So that helped certainly quite a bit, but, you know, there was still some facilities where that were very adamant that, you know, despite that, they just felt that we, um, that they only wanted individuals, um, they only wanted either COVID cases or potential COVID cases or high risk cases, which we all can probably argue on this file too, that, you know, every patient right now is high risk. So, um, and they would only allow um, the providers helping those individuals. So um, I, I did, you know, and, and I, I called back the, the Minnesota Department of Health and they, um, they actually recommended that I contact the Department of Public Safety now, every state has one of those, and specifically, I was referred to the State Emergency Operations Center, and they actually are in charge of enforcing any governor's executive order across the country. So if they suspect that any patient is not getting the services that they need, and there's potential abuse, neglect, discrimination due to COVID, they can actually take action and enforce 
that we're essential providers, if we're if the care is necessary. So um, so that certainly helped uh, because certainly having those discussions with families because I a lot you know I, I actually shared most of this and started the conversations with powers of attorneys, our families, obviously patients. Um, started wanted that you know went, went that route first, but then we you know we obviously took it a step further and went on virtual calls with the house administration or the facility administration and so forth and having these important discussions because really what it comes down to is just educating and I realize it sounds like an awful lot of time but can I just tell you when you can go when you can talk to an administration of a 500 bed facility and convince them it's easy to use that information with another facility see where I'm going with that so um, I, I can't stress enough start with one and it will just help you along the way um, but the, the, then the next challenge was dealing with group homes. Group homes, of course, because they're smaller, there's sometimes only, you know, five to six individuals living there. Of course, they they were very frightened of having anyone in their facility. And so, but we had individuals that were pretty critical. I mean, had high risk of pneumonia, just talking to them on the phone. We did throughout this um, provide some free telehealth sessions. Um, and it was very evident they needed us. Um, and so, what we did to help our efforts there is I contacted their county workers. Many of these individuals are getting county funding to live in these assisted living facilities. And if they are getting county funding, they're assigned a social worker. So um, I connected with that individual who, by the way, any social worker, to be honest, has been extremely helpful in the sense that they've been great advocates. They have shared the documents. I actually shared the documents that I've already referenced with them. And they sent emails um, on our behalf and advocating for the patient. And, and again, that was huge. And the thing that I um, found out too is through the county is, you know, they do provide funding. And um, um, through the proper channels, I was able to, um, to find out that they can actually put pressure on these facilities when they feel that a patient is being, in their opinion, being neglected, not getting the necessary they can, the care that they need, they can actually hold funds. And so, of course, when the, the county shared that with some of these facilities, all of a sudden they were calling us saying, okay, when do you want to come? And so, and granted, we made accommodations. So please know that we're not just coming in without our, you know, our PPE equipment, filling out questionnaires, making sure our temperatures are being taken in the parking lot. I mean, we're taking every measure, not only to keep them safe, but of course ourselves safe. Um, so we definitely work through all of that. And um, and certainly we're able to come up with some great policies and procedures to make them feel at ease with um, with what we're providing and of course providing all the care in the individual's rooms and we've, we've done that just as a practice even if they're allowing us to go elsewhere we just feel that's important to limit exposure uh the other thing that was helpful too in some of these group homes they were they you know although they understood and they completely agreed that we were essential what they did was they were contacting physicians asking whether they felt physicians, nurse practitioners, or PA, whether they felt we were essential. And so if that, that healthcare provider said no, then they were saying no to us based on an order that they had requested from their healthcare provider. So of course, that took some conversations with those healthcare providers to help them understand the value of our services and of course, how we can help the individual in, and obviously prevent an unnecessary hospitalization. Uh, and so again, so obviously some legwork on our part, but certainly made a difference. And, and, and I think, like I said, a lot of it is just making sure you're talking to the right individuals and educating them on the value of what we do. Um, and, you know, next, I, I have to say, this was something, um, you know, I honestly, I was getting a little desperate, you know, I wasn't, you know, I just know that, I mean, granted, I made all these calls in an afternoon that took me about three and a half hours, but um, you know, I wasn't necessarily getting return calls right away. And so I was getting a little anxious because, you know, of course, here we have staff, you know, that are more than willing to help. We have clients that are just, you know, begging for us to come. And um, so I'm thinking, okay, maybe I didn't take this a step further. And of course, my, my passion for advocacy kicked in and I contacted my state senator, who I'm very good friends with. And uh, he invited me on, I found out that they were doing a telehealth um, a uh, virtual uh, essentially meeting with healthcare providers across the state who were struggling with um, anything related to COVID, to be honest. Like, you know, it was for healthcare providers essentially sharing issues that have come up um, due to the epidemic. And um, there I was able to share because during that time, 
Um, sadly, we had two deaths um, in our caseload and two really unnecessary deaths. Unfortunately, two of our patients, um, because of not getting um, the necessary care, remember there, the, some of these facilities were prohibiting, you know, that not only just therapies, but also nursing and, and, and physicians, or um, they, they passed away. And so I shared, I was, I was able to get permission uh, to share a little bit about their cases. And of course, that um, alarmed a lot of people. I even got an email from the commissioner of our state asking for more specific information. And what I was told by him is that thanks to um, sharing those stories, they were going to enforce the executive order and also add language to prevent un future unnecessary deaths neglect, abuse, discrimination, uh, and, and this was all based on not just my story, but also others um, in the next Minnesota COVID relief package. So and I share that with you because it really just took one phone call to be able to give my patients a voice and their families who obviously were going through such a difficult time. And, they, and the individuals didn't even die of COVID. They died of things unrelated to that. They died of inactivity. So, um, and I have to tell you, that was the hardest conversation that I had to have. I was literally on this telehealth session with 17 legislators and that seriously crying. I was emotional and of course as they were, because this is so real everyone. And I, and I will be talking here. I know she has asked me to share a little bit about those cases and I would, I would love to so that I can kind of paint the picture a little bit, but there isn't really enough that we can't do. These folks need us desperately. And, um, and I would say I would just encourage you all to, I mean, even reach out to me. I'm more than happy to get on a conference call just to problem solve or even a virtual Zoom meeting and, and help you through these uh, because we can do better than this. And I know many have been afraid to work and afraid or just don't even feel that like your service is valuable. I'm here to tell you it is, and we can prevent these deaths. So that's kind of a, a little summary of kind of uh, my efforts to help these challenging times and getting access to our patients. And it sure as heck has helped so much. Eva, thank you so much. And, and, and what I want to do is just make sure that people know how to contact you. And so in addition to those resources and maybe looking at the section, taking part in and maybe developing a case report for the unintended effects of social isolation, you know, you know, it, we hear about it and we're not even treating, treating the, the COVID population, the post ICU, which is already underserved in home care, you know, um, by a lot of Dr. Jason Falvey's research. So, so if you could just give some contact information that you would be happy, maybe an email where people could reach out to you. Um, we'll get this stuff put together and get it out through the section. And hopefully this will be an informative podcast for um, our membership. And um, thank you for doing all the good work um, towards advocacy and uh, representing PT and practicing to the highest level of our license. I can't tell you that enough as, as one of your professional and association member colleagues, how important that is that we shine a light on, on, on these kind of activities and these grassroots efforts. So share away and then we'll wrap up this session. Yeah, so the best way to get a hold of me is my email, eva, eva Norman N-O-R-M-A-N, at liveyourlifept.com. And, you know, our website, liveyourlifept.com, also through that contact page, I've had therapists contact me that way, so that's another great way. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and certainly I'll be sharing some more information um, to the section so that um, you guys have things readily available to you. Thanks so much, and we hope everybody stays safe, is vigilant, and has a great rest of their week. Thank you for listening to the Home Health Minute, the podcast from the Home Health section of the American Physical Therapy Association. Check out our website at www.homehealthsection.org. There you can find links to this episode, tons of helpful resources for your practice, and how to connect with us on social media. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.